Please welcome to the stage the technical sales engineer for Zender America, John Rockwell. Thank you, and uh, good morning. It's still morning. I um, want to thank Kate for uh, inviting me to be part of the presentation. Uh, I'll spend 10 or 15 minutes talking about uh, moisture management and primarily ventilation. If you're interested in a more expansive, hour-long presentation of this, see me afterwards. So I do a lot of lunch and learns and presentations at conferences and things like that. I've actually been at uh, Tony's office and, and Mark's office in the last year or two. So, okay. So let's move forward. Um, it goes without saying that uh, ventilation doesn't matter at all if you don't manage bulk water on the outside of a building or in the inside of a building that comes up from down below and wells up through the, uh, through the foundation or the, or the slab. So in the luxury of new construction, you can often manage that uh, very easily with overhangs and sloping soil and things like that. But in an existing building, the challenges are many and sometimes very expensive dealing with bulk moisture on the outside of buildings. Uh, especially with maintenance issues on the outside of buildings and roof drains that aren't working and, and all sorts of things that can, uh, can occur. So sometimes you have to resort to uh, costly interior solutions to keep things dry because there's no point in finishing off a space if you can't keep that water out, particularly in old rubble foundations where water can seep in. Big problem. But there are ways to mitigate that using sort of dimple mat technologies or spray foam that sort of seals the wall, kind of entombs the wall separately from the interior space. So there's a number of different ways to, to do that. Uh, there's specialized companies that do that specifically, and that really has to be thought of before you tackle the ventilation side of things. Um, when I talk about ventilation to talk about indoor air quality, I'm not talking about uh, anything about heating or anything about cooling. I'm simply talking about bringing fresh air in. You all are are very well versed in some kinds of ventilation. Typically the bath fan that you switch on in the morning when you turn the lights on, or if you're taking a shower and you have a separate fan, you can turn that on. And that usually evacuates the moisture and odors out of a space, whether it's a bathroom or a kitchen. Those are code required locations for ventilation. Whether they work or not is a different story. Uh, I've been in a lot of buildings where, uh, for instance, yesterday in Florida, I always check the ventilation in the bathroom by putting a piece of tissue on the grill. It was actually blowing waste stale air into the space. So, and that was, uh, I've been in LEED Platinum certified buildings that do exactly the same thing. Um, this device is a heat recovery ventilation system that uses a spe specialized kind of ductwork. It's much, much more comprehensive than you'd need for a basement retrofit. I'm going to show you a really ideal through the wall solution that could be a, a great solution provided some of the apartment is above grade and you have access to, to daylight or, or some clear space. So the mechanical codes that exist now are requiring buildings to be more and more airtight. Not so that basements are more habitable, but so that energy is saved. The primary way that energy is lost through buildings is through unwanted, uncontrolled exfiltration, the removal of air out of the building, and the influx of air in through the building. This is exacerbated when there's a greater difference in temperature between indoors and outdoors, uh, delta T we call it. And it's also exacerbated in tall buildings. So skyscrapers in Fairbanks, Alaska have a real challenge to fight against the influx of air in the lower floors. So in multifamily buildings, upper floors often can be uncomfortably warm. People are using their windows as their thermostat. I'm sure you've seen that before. But down in basements, we really need to control how much leakage gets into apartment, not just of bulk water, uh, but also of air. And in the intrusion of air in August in New York City can introduce all sorts of humidity problems. So how do we manage that? A bathroom fan isn't really going to cut it uh, if, if you've designed the, the space or retrofit it in a way where it's as airtight as it can possibly be. Relying on windows for ventilation is a kind of uh, old-fashioned strategy that might work in San Diego or Costa Rica or something where there's no humidity, uh, where there aren't safety concerns, noise concerns, things like that, trash being stored outside the building. So windows aren't a reliable way to do it. A good way to do that is with a balanced ventilation system. I'm going to go right by that slide. And um, one of the reasons why we don't use bathroom fans in new construction anymore that's airtight is that every time you turn on that fan, if it's moving 50, 60, 80, 100 cubic feet per minute of air out of the bathroom, that must mean that that same amount of air is being sucked into the space. Now that's not what we want to do in an environment where fuel is expensive, um, heating and uh, energy is expensive, and when moisture can uh, come in during the summertime, that's a big problem in your wall assemblies. In the freezing cold winter, you have to temper that air, so it's not a good strategy, really. 
you depressurize that space, and that's what those minus signs mean. Um, a solution to that is instead of using bathroom fans that cause a negative pressure inside the building, is to use what's called balanced ventilation, where you meet the requirements of the mechanical codes to exhaust stale air uh, and moisture out of spaces like kitchens and bathrooms. But you match that with an equal amount of supply, fresh filtered air that's supplied typically to sleeping spaces. In a studio, it would just be somewhere in the sleeping location. And as long as those amounts are the same, you do not introduce of negative or positive pressure on the space. Negative pressure invites air from the outside and possibly moisture and critters and who knows what. But once the vent ventilation is balanced, there's no dynamic, there's no physics uh, imbalance between indoors and out. By so doing, you bring in much, much fresher air. And if you filter it with good filtration, you could argue that the indoor air quality is better than the outdoor air quality. How to do that? What's, what's called a heat recovery ventilation system. The magic of a heat recovery system is that, as I said earlier, you're bringing in fresh air and exhausting stale air. And where those two air streams pass one another in this thing called a heat recovery core, there's material that divides the air stream up into many, many tiny air streams. Because there's a lot of surface area to volume ratio, there's a lot of heat transfer. So if you, it's just the exact same principle when somebody comes in from the cold and you shake their hands. The second law of thermodynamics is happening and physics just makes energy go from warmer to colder. And that's how an HRV works. So there's no air leakage across those air streams, but there's a temperature transfer, a thermal energy transfer that happens. HRVs are less common in this region because they only transfer heat and they don't do anything with humidity. To manage both heat transfer and also moisture, we use what's called an ERV, uh, most commonly called an energy recovery ventilator. It's, it really stands for enthalpy recovery ventilator. But it does the same exact thing. The incoming airstream bypasses the outgoing airstream. And if there's a temperature difference, it'll transfer some of that thermal energy. And if there's a difference in the vapor content, and they're very much is, is bound to be that case in a nice dry interior in the wintertime, or excuse me, a nice relatively humid interior in the wintertime and dry cold air on the outside. So instead of bringing fresh air in that dries out the space, it actually gets moisture from the outgoing airstream. And there's a heat transfer as well. So it's a pretty simple process, even though that was a long paragraph, that uh, describes how to transfer energy, uh, both thermal and, and moisture energy, from one airstream to the other. They're sweeping the nation in terms of high performance construction. In Europe, they're quite common. You wouldn't ask somebody in Europe if they have an HRV. They'd be like asking, do you have a fridge? Um, and so it's nice to have these uh, products. So in our market, in this, in this uh, environment in New York City, moisture is a big concern in the summertime. So if you're bringing in humid air with just leakage or an open window, you're going to cause your air conditioning or your requirement for dehumidification to go up substantially. Um, but an ERV will transfer about two-thirds of the moisture, that is of the difference in the moisture in the airstreams, and 85% of the temperature that goes through there. So for example, if it's a really hot August day, 100 degrees in the city, and you're trying to keep the basement at 70 degrees, the basement apartment at 70, that's a delta T of 30 degrees with 85 or 84% heat recovery. You're going to bring that outdoor air temperature down quite close to room temperature, thus reducing the re energy requirements of your heating and cooling systems. Same thing in winter, where there's usually a bigger delta T. During the polar vortex, when it could be 10 degrees out here or zero degrees out here and 70 indoors, you're going to be making up a lot of that delta T and bringing fresh air in. You're not using a electric resistance heat. You're not using a, a hydronic coil or anything like that. You're simply using the physics of energy transfer between one airstream and another. So I didn't go into too much detail about the other kinds of ventilation, but I, in my Lunch and Learns, I usually say, OK, the ones we've used all our lives, exhaust ventilations, drag air that we don't want in. Supply ventilation, simply opening windows or connecting a, a rooftop unit to your ventilation system with no heat recovery, I find those morally reprehensible. And so can we use balanced ventilation with heat recovery? That's the strategy that I'd like to suggest here. Because we always have to deal with not just the air quality outside, but contaminants that are inside a space. New products that are brought in that might have formaldehyde in them, the glues that hold furniture together, carpets, uh, human contamination, CO2, uh, skin that sloughs off all the time, millions and millions of cells all the time. We want to try and keep the interior as clean as possible. Um, obviously, volatile organic compounds and all the things that we're kind of used to. A lot of project, uh, people who suffer from respiratory issues find that with balanced ventilation, filtered the fresh air that comes in, their symptoms redu are reduced. And it's tangible. 
If you use balanced ventilation with heat recovery, you no longer have to rely on windows for ventilation. Arguably, you can make places that would otherwise be less habitable, whether it's crime or noise or, or external sources that would otherwise make it unpleasant to open a window, you have more opportunity to have good indoor air quality without relying on windows. The other thing is that if you use a bathroom fan that exhausts stale air and you're dragging in humid air, the interior humidity could rise up above certain levels such that typically what is the limit is about 60% relative humidity where mold can become a big issue. And if you have paper-faced drywall or other products that are cellulitic, you will have a mold problem at extended periods of RH above 60%. So balanced ventilation with good heat recovery and moisture recovery can keep those, the range of interior humidity at a safe level between 35 and 60% uh, RH. In a larger space that isn't the basement studio conversion, um, you would typically exhaust from stale areas and moist areas and then equal amounts of supply air to sleeping areas. And it's really important that you do it to the sleeping areas because if there's a bedroom with the door shut, lots of tests have shown that CO2 levels without fresh air coming into that space can get up to, not dangerous levels because CO2 is not as bad a contaminant as CO, but very unhealthful levels that don't encourage good sleep. So while Mark had a nice sleep in Albany, I bet if he lived there over extended periods, <laughs> there'd be a problem, okay? <laughs> Could you hit play for me? Here's an example of a ventilation unit that goes right through the wall of a basement. Um, and I'm not here to sell anything. I'm here to just talk about a particular strategy. Lots of manufacturers make this. I might be able to hit forward and it'll work. Great. And that was it, thank you. Swiss product, there's virtually no dust created in a project like this. Keeping it airtight by sealing the inside and outside with foam for that sleeve. the outdoor air, what we call the uh, supply air coming in, providing fresh air to the space, picking up contaminants as it's going through the space and then being sucked back into the ERV and then distributed outside. Flow rates are determined by mechanical codes. Um, there's a number of different speeds you can set. I won't go into any detail about that right now. Those numbers are really important so you're not increasing your requirements for heating and cooling and dehumidification.
So the point of all that is to, uh, is to say that a separate ventilation system uh, that has separate ductwork, separate registers, separate components can get extremely expensive. And I know that that's not the uh, strategy we're trying to employ here. So a through-the-wall unit, provided there's a grade where you're not putting the unit directly against the, the, the curb or the sidewalk and has some clearance, uh, can be an ideal solution. Um, we can talk about stack effect later, but I think I'm probably nearing the end of my time. Um, and so that through wall solution always provides fresh air coming in and always provides stale air leaving the space. The flow rates are beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. It really depends on the size and number of plumbing components in the space. But it's a very direct way to bring fresh air in, exhaust stale air just like the code requires, and do it with filtration and managing humidity so that you don't exacerbate the problems that are inherent to building below grade. So I think I open it up to questions if that's the format of how we're doing this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Um, I, I think, uh, given the time, maybe I only have one or two questions. Yep. My question is... That's okay, you can skip through those, yeah. ...is about, um, so with new construction, mm. airtight environments, yep. everything is energy code compliant, uh, you know, so energy code compliant that the exhaust air comes out of the vents, right? I'm joking, but that a system like that, that's great. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yep. If what we're talking about in New York City is trying to find a way to provide fresh air to a basement of uh, a newly created apartment in a building that's maybe 100 years old, mm -hmm. that was uninsulated, that doesn't have its pipes uh, um, at every level, uh, you know, gasketed and, and, and yep. fitted for yep. air efficiency, and the thing leaks like a sieve. When a wind blows outside, it blows inside. That's the house you start with, mm -hmm. um, and you're unlikely to necessarily renovate the entire building and make it all up to snuff. Is, is it cost effective to use systems like this in basement apartments? Uh, initially, there might be a higher cost to using a <clears throat> balanced ventilation system than an exhaust-only bathroom fan situation. Mm -hmm. But long term, uh, you're going to create very uh, poor qualitative uh, issues with, I mean, the complicated air pathways in buildings that you, if they're not going to be made more airtight, not going to be sort of sealed with respect to the apartment above or the floor above, you're going to have um, sometimes reverse stack effect, and there will be moisture problems inherent with that. So I do believe that if you're going to be putting up new stud walls, if that's what we're talking about, there's an opportunity to use a fairly airtight approach to that, thus making a balanced ventilation solution where there's never pressure differences between inside and out is going to be long-term a better solution. Hmm. Just a, a comment. I'm, I'm glad to see that you're focusing on air quality because yeah. one of my concerns uh, from the fire service is we're worried about CO. So if you make a really tight basement, which is a good thing, uh, nice sheetrock all around and everything, so I, I'm not worried about fire breaking out, but I'm worried about the heating plant drawing a lot of air, especially in the cold winter months, person going to sleep, and then if we get a, a you know, it's uh, not properly ducted, doesn't have enough air, uh, getting uh, a reverse flow of that CO. Yeah. So I'm concerned that these heating plants get properly designed and engineered, that they have the right airflow. So I'm just glad to see that uh, people are looking at air. It's a, yeah. It's a problem. One thing you remind me of is that um, it's one thing to design and engineer them properly. It's another to commission it in the field to actually get it to work properly. And I think a lot of people look the other way when something is installed and maybe do drive-by commissionings and things don't really work, especially maybe for the market segment that you're, you're targeting. So I think it really is critical to make sure the systems work the way they're supposed to. Now, the thing is, you can go and measure the flow out of a bathroom exhaust-only fan under certain weather conditions, but then another season, all bets are off in terms of how it actually works. And if I found that stale air can be coming back through my exhaust system in a bathroom of a LEED-certified building because they didn't commission it on a cold season, they commissioned it in during warm weather, who knows what could happen and what other air pathways, if they weren't sealed properly, could be contaminating that airstream and bringing CO into the space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John.